so thank you everyone for, for coming to our training. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk about migrating from Cori to Perlmutter and I'm gonna be um, focusing on, on CPU codes. All right. So this is this is my outline. Uh, you can of course, sort of broadly break this talk up into to five sections. Um, uh, but you know, there's a, quite a bit of overlap between different parts of this. So uh, let's here we go. Uh, so I begin by talking about modules, and modules um, are essentially how you access uh, pre-installed software on the system. And uh, the big difference between Cori and Perlmutter is we have a new module system on Perlmutter. Um, it does uh, look very similar to uh, the one on Cori, but it is slightly different. So um, when you first log on to Perlmutter, there will be a set of modules loaded by default. So this is sort of like the, the, the environment configuration or the software that's already loaded on your system when you start up if you haven't made any other modifications. And this includes things like um, you know, optimizations for the CPU architecture. That's what you see here in yellow. Uh, it also includes the GNU programming environment, which includes the GCC compiler. Those are these highlighted in red. And uh, by default, um, because Perlmutter is a GPU system, we have by default a lot of um, modules uh, geared toward GPUs. So um, if you're doing a CPU code, uh, what the, one of the first things you're going to want to do is to type module load CPU, which will reconfigure this environment uh, for CPU coding. And you can see basically what it does is it unloads a lot of the GPU specific modules uh, from your environment and um, will also turn off computer CUDA aware MPI, uh, which you know um, which may cause problems for you if you're uh, trying to compile your code later um, and don't want it. <laughs> um, largely, however, the module system works similar to what you're used to on Cori. Uh, you know, module list is the same as before. Uh, module load and unload is still going to be how you uh, load packages into your environment and unload packages in, from your environment. Um, the big difference here is going to be module spider. And, and I want to point this out because this is also going to be a common one that you use because this is going to be how you find uh, software that you want to load into your environment, uh, specific packages and, and, and other and whatnot. Um, Previously on Cori, you would have used uh, module avail and module avail will still work on Perlmutter. It just won't show you everything. And I'm gonna show you an example that sort of drives that point home in the next uh, slides. Uh, but, but for now, commonly used module commands that you're gonna be using on Perlmutter. These ones here, module swap still works. It's still useful. Uh, module show I think is really useful and I'll do another slide on that later. It will tell you what is going on when you load a module into your environment. And um, I have I have two cool tricks. I'll just briefly describe this one, and I'll let you try this one on your own uh, next time you're on the system. Uh, but this one is what it's going to do. Essentially, is going to take the module spider command and it's going to pipe it to grep. But to make that clean, you can use this redirect flag, right? And that's the dash dash redirect. And then for the spider command, you can tell it to use uh, to search by regular expression with this dash r flag. And that's why I just use a dot, which is basically tells it um, search for every single thing in this in the module system and pipe the output to grep. And then you can use grep to search for the string you want. So if you're more familiar or more comfortable using your own you know text searching uh, tools, uh, you can do it with that cool trick. Um, and uh, for more information on this, you can look for the uh, docs for the LMOD environment. So um, what is the difference between module spider and module avail on Perlmutter, right? So if you use module and spider um, on Perlmutter, it will search without regard for hierarchy. So on Perlmutter, the, the module files are kind of arranged in such a way that if you were to type well, if you are looking for a module with module avail, it will not be shown to you unless you have all the dependencies already loaded. So 
in that sense, if you're typing module available, and unless, if unless you can just uh, load that, if, unless you already have all the dependencies, the dependent modules loaded in your system, module available will not show you that module as being avail available, right? So um, that's why you're going to see difference in the output between module spider and module available. So in this example, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be just searching for Cray Net CDF. This is that's the name of the module I want, and if this is going to show you the difference uh, between what happens as I go through this process. So, um, bear with me as I as it types what I just said. <laughs> These are the modules I currently have loaded, um, and just to point out that it's not there, I'm going to try to just load it. It's just it's not available. Is what it says, right? I try to um, also use module shows, still not telling me anything. When I use module avail to look for it, uh, you notice that I get Cray parallel net CDF, which is not what I'm looking for here, right? And so it almost seems like Cray, we, Cray net CDF doesn't exist. Well, if I use Cray module spider, Cray net CDF, ah, all of a sudden I've discovered it. Now with module spider, if I type out the module name and the version, I get even more detailed information. And that's where it tells me that I need to load Cray HDF5 first if I want to load uh, Cray net CDF. So that's what happens here. And we see that the module's now loaded here. So this, uh, this example, uh, which, uh, we'll leave with the slides so that you can uh, view it as many times as you'd like. Uh, shows you that, you know, module spider with Spider-Man defeats our, our, our Superman hero module available um, in this case uh, in searching for Cray net CDF. So we're really going to recommend to users to, to kind of change that default habit and, and move toward module spider. Another useful module command is, is module show. and um, you know, so so this slide is a lot of text, uh, but what I wanted you to see is that module show gives you a lot of information about what the module is doing when you type module load a particular package. So it's essentially doing these three, uh, two, two large categories, right? Which is changing your paths and uh, setting some environmental variables. So if you see in yellow, like these are the things I've highlighted as changes to paths, right? Um, you can see it's adding the place where these create HDF5 libraries exist. Uh, down here, right where I have the HDF5 directory and HDF5 root, it's setting those environmental variables so that when your applications are looking for HDF5, um, they might search for this environmental variable to try to find where it's located. Um, and that's where this is being done. The other important uh, reason to show you this is um, sometimes uh, people in part of their building their code, have these uh, library paths hard coded, and uh, it might be helpful just to be able to look at the location of the library and to that might help you sort of troubleshoot or or kind of take a shortcut to solving uh, some of your compile issues if you need a specific library and you're trying to look at where to find it. Okay. So uh, in the next section, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about programming environments, and we'll get into a little bit more about compilers and, 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 and things that go along with it. So um, I'm going to focus on, on three main programming environments on Perlmutter. Um, the default one is program, I call it program environment. I always call it GNU, but I guess you call it GNU. Uh, the big new one um, is programming environment NVIDIA. For us, uh, when we're talking about CPU only, I, I, you know, I, I expect that we may not use that one as much. Um, however, you know, um, maybe if you are going from starting at CPUs and moving to GPUs, you might focus on that more. Um, program environment NVIDIA is also totally capable of compiling CPU only code. So um, if you want to try it out, it, it's uh, definitely worth a try um, if you're trying to get stuff to work. Um, Program environment Cray uses the Cray compilers, uh, and it should be listed here. Um, that's another uh, viable option. So usually, like we, we've set this as a default, we usually suggest that people start by, if it's your first time trying to compile your code on Perlmutter, we suggest you start with the programming environment GNU and then sort of branch out to the other ones. Um, 
and and to see if you know you get better performance or or you're able to compile in places where you couldn't compile before but that's kind of our general advice um one thing I'm going to be emphasizing in the next few slides is about wrappers. So the wrappers kind of work in tandem with the programming environment. So as you can see here, um, to use the G++ compiler for C++, I'm going to use this capital CC wrapper. And if I was in programming environment NVIDIA, so if I was over here and I was just typing CC in programming environment GNU, it would call the G++ compiler. If I was in this environment and I used the CC wrapper, it would call the NVC++ compiler, right? Um, that's what's, what this table is showing you, how each one of these um, compilers changes uh, for the wrapper as you change uh, programming environments. And you know, for MPI, each one of these uses uh, the create and pitch MPI that we, the default that we recommend. So how do you load a programming environment? Uh, just like the other modules, right? Module load, programming environment. Uh, if you want to switch from one to another, for example, if I'm going from GNU to Cray, I can type module load, program environment Cray. I don't necessarily have to swap or unload uh, like maybe previously. Um, so that is slightly more convenient. Um, but like I said, the programming environments kind of work in tandem with the compiler wrappers. And I kind of want to continue to sort of encourage you to use the compiler wrappers. And that's what, what this slide is, is sort of talking about. This is sort of showing you um, not only does the compiler wrapper like sort of automatically set the compiler based off of your programming environment, but it also includes many other things that you don't necessarily see. So um, in this dark blue line here, I have like a, a sort of a typical compile line that I would do with the GCC compiler. And um, that's just, I'm compiling a hello world example with a few flags to give it open MP and to tell it what, how to output my code. And the second line down here in the light blue area, I'm using the compiler wrapper. Now, I also added this flag that says create PE dash verbose, which is going to basically tell it, tell me all the extra things that are happening behind the scene when I type this compile line. However, I want to point out that if I did not have this red box flag here, the output you would see would be exactly the same as you would see from this one here, right? And the command would, you know, all this down here would go away and it would look just as simple. So the only difference between these two is I've added this flag to say, hey, you know, tell me all the extra flags that are being added by the create PE compiler wrappers and tell me a little bit out of all the amazing things that are that are happening. So that's what you see down here, right? So once you show all that stuff, this create compiler wrapper in this example, I'm in the programming, uh, the GNU programming environment. So it's calling GCC and it adds a flag to optimize um, for the CPU architecture. It also has additional flags to, to further optimize for architecture. Um, it is including you know, our default mpitch. Right? It's also including the science libraries um, and several other things uh, that we will find helpful. And you know, this, this list goes on quite a bit, but it's kind of too big for one slide. So let me cut off here. Furthermore, um, if you're using the wrappers, uh, several things will automatically link. You know, like I showed you, MPI, those the, the, the science libraries like uh, LAPAC, BLOS, Scala Pack, and more. If you've loaded Cray modules, those get automatically linked by the compiler wrappers. Um, a quick kind of a side note about the scientific libraries: if you're looking for LAPAC, Scala Pack, BLOS, those they are included in the Cray LibSci um, module. Um, and for more information about exactly what's in there and, and how to use it, I recommend the Typing, the, looking at the manual with man lib sci. Um, I'll tell you more about that. Modules are linked dynamically by default. Um, you know, so when you load these modules into your your environment, a lot of the times they'll be the paths will be prepended to the LD library path or this create LD library path. The shared libraries will be dynamically linked. Um, 
if you're compiling with your own shared libraries, we consider you know adding these options for the R path. Um, in general, you should know that Cray wrappers build dynamically linked executables by default. Um, one thing to be careful about is if you were using the static flag or this Cray environmental Cray environment variable down here, Cray PE link type equals static. Um, this can fail on Perlmutter and and it's not supported at this point still. So, um, so we would recommend that you not do that. <laughs> uh, so just to kind of, you know, compilers and flags, there are a lot of them. And uh, it's a little bit daunting to just keep barraging you with more and more flags. Uh, but um, I've only got a few more flags for you. <laughs> So this table sort of puts those things together. Uh, I've separated them out. So if you're, this is the GNU programming environment. This is the Cray programming environment. This is the NVIDIA programming environment. And I've just pulled out a few common uh, compiler flags that you might want to use um, with your codes. Um, typically, you can see that the Cray and GNU behave almost identically. However, if you're compiling codes in the programming, uh, the NVIDIA programming environment, you may need to make some small um, changes to, to achieve the same things. Um, one thing to, to point out here is a big difference between Cori and Perlmutter is that OpenMP is not enabled by default on Perlmutter. So if you want your codes to incorporate OpenMP, you need to add the flags. And the flags for GNU is just F OpenMP, but on NVIDIA, that flag is different. Um, and it's just HMP. Um, and again, uh, I will tell you that from my personal preference uh, to get into the nitty gritty details of the flags on the compilers, the, the manual pages are, are really helpful um, in, in using, you know, searching through those can be uh, a quick way to get definitive information about what you need. So that's why I've listed the manuals here uh, in case you need more specific uh, requirements um, and questions, uh, this can be a good source. Another thing to point out, because, um, you know, what we've, in my experience, uh, you know, a lot of people coming from Cori to Perlmutter are usually bringing codes that um, may be a few years old by now. Uh, and one of the big differences between Cori and Perlmutter is we don't have the Intel programming environment and the Intel compilers uh, that go with it, um, at least at this moment. And so, when you're trying to compile code on Cori, if you were compiling with the Intel compilers, you might find it doesn't automatically compile with the GNU compiler on Perlmutter. And so we have some sort of tips here to kind of help you with things like that. Um, so that's what's on this, this slot, right? So for Fortran, um, especially older Fortran, uh, we, one of the flags we recommend you try when you're, if you're having trouble uh, compiling and when you move to Perlmutter, is this allow argument mismatch, right? So this is kind of a more specific uh, targeted thing um, about what it's telling the compiler to ignore. But if, you know, to take that sort of farther in the like ignore everything you can direction <laughs> about, you know, sort of older code practices that may no longer be allowed, you can use this, um, the standard equal legacy flag uh, which will, again, reduce the sort of strictness of the compiler and allow it to sort of bend the rules a bit more, like sort of maybe the older compilers were famous for allowing. Um, if you're talking about C or C++, there's, again, the same idea. Try to find some flags that reduce strictness just to get your code compiling. Uh, we have this permissive flag. Um, this other, the W pandemic, pan, pedantic, pedantic, can warn you about lines that break uh, code standards. So these are some suggestions to help you get your code um, compiling if you're having any difficulty with that uh, on Perlmutter. It's, it's worth just trying them and, and seeing if you hit the jackpot. Okay. Um, so in the next section, I have just a few quick tips about CMake and make files. And, and 
when I'm talking about make files here, I'm talking about make files in the auto tool sense, not the make files that CMake makes. So I just wanted to kind of make that distinction. Um, the other thing I would kind of want to point out here is these uh, the 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 tips are sort of high level because when we start getting into build systems like CMake and Make Files, they're usually there for when you're compiling fairly complicated code, which usually means your Make Files and and your CMake build systems are fairly complicated. So. Um, these these really are some tips. They might you know it might be kind of hit or miss for each person, but uh, you know hopefully a few hits make it worthwhile. So uh, in particular, the reason why this comes up here is because when we're using the Cray wrappers, a lot of times uh, deep down in those you know that CMake build system or in the make files for auto tools, the compiler has been hard coded and won't uh, accept. Um, the compiler, create compiler wrappers the way we think it should. Uh, and the first thing to try if something like that is happening is to use one of these two techniques. So if you're doing the typical um, auto tools method where you configure and it makes a make file, then you make and then you um, install, right? The way you do that is with a line like this, right? Where you tell it, the things before when you were asking for the, the CC, you want the C compiler, the CXX, that's the CC wrapper, for the FC, you want the FTN wrapper, right? So give it, that will point it into the right uh, create compiler wrapper for each of the compilers you want, the C compiler, the C++ compiler, the Fortran compiler. Uh, for CMake, if you're having that similar type of issue, like this is typing this line on the same line as your CMake command or, um, before you call it, uh, can help remedy the same problem, right? It's it's doing the same thing. It's telling um, your code ahead of time that you want to use this, the C compiler compiled by the wrapper or the, the, the Craig wrapper for this C compiler, C++ and Fortran and so on, right? So, uh, as I mentioned before, like make files and the CMake build system can be incredibly complex. So what I have here is a really kind of like um, basic example uh, that points out kind of like where I would start to look for things if I was having problems with my make file and some sort of easy adjustments I can make uh, to incorporate the Cray wrappers, which would allow me potentially to solve some problems uh, compiling my code. So uh, in particular, right, if this is sort of my example make file, so this is really like an existing make file, like you already have one that's set up and you just type um, uh, make to, to compile your code. Um, you're looking for a make file that looks something like this. At the top of it, you will definitely see several uh, environmental variables defined. One of the ones you're gonna be looking for when we're talking about compiler wrappers specifically is, is the CC or the CXX or these type of things here. In this case, you see in this example, which I took directly off the web, they've what I'm going to call hard coded the compiler to be the GCC compiler. So that means if I switch to the other compilers, I'm not going to be switching away from the GCC compiler. If I'm in the Cray programming environment or the NVIDIA programming environment, I'm always going to get sent back to the GCC compiler. Um, you know, which in the case of C may not be a huge deal, but this illustrates the point well. So if I'm looking to the make file and I see an issue like this, what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to change this so that it points now to the C compiler, right? Because I'm this is the C compiler that it, it wants, so I'm giving it a C compiler. So that's the lowercase cc. And once I do that, that's all I need to uh, incorporate the Cray compiler wrappers uh, into this build system. So now when I type make, it's going to use the Cray compiler wrappers. It's going to do all those optimizations and other stuff I told you about before all hidden in the background as part of everything you want. So um, I, you know, when you're looking through your make files, if you notice something like we talked about before and you can make this easy edit, I suggest you, you give that a try and see if that helps you out. That was my tip for make files. My next tip is on CMake and it really can be boiled down to one thing and that is this application called CC Make. So um, what I have on this slide is basically the walkthrough. If you're not 
uh, totally familiar with the CMake build process. This is kind of how it typically goes. So on this first line, I'm just kind of showing you what files are in the directory that I'm in right now. In this case, I have the code I want to compile, and it has a CMake list text file, which is what CMake use, uses to know how to build your uh, code. Um, I have a typo here because I need to make a directory. But so I make my directory, I move into my directory. And so I'm building this code from a directory above it. Um, uh, or, or the directory outside of it. And then I use CMake that I call with a dot dot to, um, this is kind of analogous to the configure step, but this is how you invoke CMake and it will do make it CMake files as part of the build process. Now, if I get to this step, right, and this is working, or even if it's not working, I can type ccmake dot dot and it will bring up the ccmake interface. So that's kind of like where in the CMake build process you can use this tool. And what it looks like is it's a graphical, it gives you a, a user, a graphical user interface to kind of investigate the different uh, parameters in your build. So in particular, like in this example, I'm I'm using it on that simple example with one CMake list and one, you know, the the hello world OpenMP CC file. I'm I'm trying to do it to, to compile. And you can see that CMake so sort of automatically fill in a lot of these uh, values. Now on the screen that I'm showing you now, I've turned on advanced mode basically because we're focusing on which compilers are being chosen. And here I'm going to look on the, for this line in particular, I'm looking at the C++ compiler. And you see here that the C++ compiler was chosen to be this one, right? So what that tells me if I'm inspecting the CMake build process with this tool, CCC make, that CMake did not pick up the Cray compiler wrappers for some reason, right? And that can indicate to me that I have to go back into some part uh, into the CMake list, um, CMake's, um, you know, into that, that file to configure CMake, or I may have to configure something different in my environment so that it picks this up correctly. So if I were to do something like that, or if maybe I was looking at a project that picked those up correctly, you would see something more like this, right? So if I was looking here at the CCX, CXX compiler, you can see that this one has Cray PE 2.7.19 bin CC, right? That is the Cray wrapper for this Cray C++ compiler, um, the Cray wrapper for the C++ compiler that we want, right? So um, if I saw this, I'd say, oh, okay, CMake is picking up the compiler the way I expected to, and it's and it's doing what I wanted to. Um, the other thing to point out here is this is page one of nine. There's a lot of information here that you can kind of look through to look for issues. Um, you know, depending on if you're having trouble with your your build system. So I I like this tool um, and I find it helpful. Uh, for finding issues. Doesn't necessarily solve them for you, but knowing where the problem is is usually pretty helpful. Okay. All right. So, you know, summarizing back to where we are, those things that I pointed out, that's what we're trying to address by giving you these tips, right? To try this line here or to try this in your configure step. And and for more details about this, as always, um, we have docs on these things that can be quite helpful um, that I still personally find helpful. So I'm feel fine to share them with you. Okay. Um, in the next section, I'm gonna show you a few quick examples. Uh, I think I'm gonna just do one um, based on how things are going uh, for uh, compiling code on Perlmutter. Um, the main takeaway here is that the thing I cannot say loud enough is if you go from Cori to Perlmutter, you should probably recompile your code. Um, the architectures are different enough. There's optimizations, optimizations in there that will speed up your code. You know, you will code will run faster if you recompile it on Perlmutter. It's very possible that if you take it directly from Cori to Perlmutter, it won't run at all. So recompile your code on Perlmutter. The example I'm going to show you is just a simple. Uh, MPI and OpenMP example of a hello world. It's going to say, um, you know, hello from different threads and processes um, and out to the screen. Um, so that, you know, this is kind of pared down as much as possible, I think, for this example. 
Um, and I'm doing this from the GNU programming environment. And, you know, like I said, this is, uh, you know, a fairly straightforward example, but maybe this is just uh, give us a taste of how to do this. You can see I have the just the uh, default list again. Um, I'm going to compile with the compiler wrapper, you know, in this case, the lowercase cc. And the things to point out here is that you saw in the compile line, I told it to use OpenMP, right? I had to include that because that's not included by default on Perlmutter. So you, if you want OpenMP, you have to include it there. Now I'm giving it the um, variables, setting the variables to, to do the threading. And then I run the code and, and yay, it works, right? So the big takeaway from this simple example is that if you're compiling with the compiler wrappers and you've been compiling with the compiler wrappers on Cori, you should find that these are very similar, right? It should be a very similar experience. Uh, the only main difference is if you want to open MP, you have to include the flag now, right? That was not the case before. So, um, that's the moral of the story here. Um, I have another compiler example here. I'm just going to leave it here. You can watch it later. It, it uh, you know, down, uses the library that I downloaded and, and links it in um, and shows you how to do that. But that will exist for eternity for you to look at it when it's convenient for you. Um, in the next section, I'm going to talk a little bit about understanding job parameters. And I do this because you know your job parameters are going to change when you run from coming from Cori to Perlmutter, right? Because the architecture is different. And if you understand what each of those parameters mean, that's gonna help you make intelligent choices about them. So that's why I take this, this perspective. So, uh, you know, when you wanna run a job, you have a job script. That's what we're looking at here. Um, in particular, the things I'm going to be focusing on are the things that are highlighted um, very, very lightly <laughs> in different colors is this part here, this part here, these parts here, these parts down here. And it's gonna be, you know, sort of how do you understand these parts and how do you make choices about these? To understand these parts, the key terms I'm gonna focus on are node, MPI task, logical CPU, thread, physical core, processor, and um, advanced terms is gonna be the NUMA domain. Um, so the last time we did query to Perlmutter training, I spent more time on NUMA domain. I'm not gonna spend as much time on it this time. If you're if you're interested in hearing me talk about it a little bit more than, than that uh, video, it's still available online. So today I'm gonna to give you the shortened version. Okay, so here we are. Node, processor, physical core, and logical CPU. One of the difficulties with keeping all these parts of the architecture straight is I feel like the names are very easy to mix up. Um, I, you know, people say different things at different times and they seem to mean different things at different times. So I'm gonna start by defining what I'm gonna mean for the rest of this talk when I say each word. So if you look at our page for Perlmutter system architecture, it's gonna say two AMD Epic Milan CPUs. I'm gonna call that two AMD Epic Milan processors. So when I say the processors, I mean the same thing as this, right? And it's gonna say 64 cores per CPU. I'm gonna use the word 64 physical cores per processor, right? So I'm changing CPU to processor here and cores I'm gonna call physical cores. When we start talking about two hyper threads per core, I'm gonna call those two logical CPUs per physical core, right? We got the cores being physical cores, hyperthreads being logical CPUs, right? Numa domains um, per socket, I'm gonna say Numa domains per processor, right? So here we have the diagram of a CPU node. I've got one processor here. I've got another processor here. This whole thing together with the two processors is one node, right? And inside each of these processors, well, we've got a nice picture here. Um, here, the wider blue square is my node, right? Inside my node, I have two processors. In this picture, it's the yellow parts, right? Each one of the processors, can, you can think of it looking kind of like this, right? Inside each processor, you have physical cores, right? These are the little tiny things, right? And here and here and here, here and here and here, bunch of physical cores. Each physical core is capable of, processing two um, 
instruction threads. And because of that, I'm going to say inside of each physical core, there are two logical CPUs. So one physical core, two logical CPUs, right? And so that's how the words that I'm using translates to the architecture for the Perlmutter compute node. And I'm going to try to keep using those exact terms for the rest of the talk. All right. So now to sort of understand a little better about how the architecture works, I'm going to give you kind of an analogy. And the analogy is an office building analogy, which is probably wholly unoriginal, but that's OK. Um, so here I have my office building. It, you can think of it as full of nodes. Maybe each floor is a node. And on each floor, there are like maybe two uh, office layouts like this that we can think of as processors, right? Like, because this is sort of how the breakdown of our node works. Um, inside it, we've got two office floors, which are more two processors. Our office floor is made up of little tiny cubicles, right? Where people do work inside of each cubicle, right? Those are the physical cores on our system. And, um, you know, I, I gave it away because I had the same picture last time, but um, I'm going to hold it to the end. But this cubicle could represent only one sort of specific hardware we have here at NERSC. Um, and I'll let people try to guess in the, in the Google Doc and figure out what it is, or or maybe in the chat would probably be better not to not to muck it up. I don't know, but I'll give away the answer by the end, or somebody else will. Uh, and then we could also think of our cubicle as sort of set up like this, right? And that would represent that would correspond to our physical cores inside of our processor, right? Each one of these little boxes. But inside each one of these little boxes, right? Whether it's shaped like this or whether it's shaped like this, you've got a little worker doing your instruction thread. And that is the logical CPU, right? That is the hardware thread. So these are your workers inside your cubicles, which are your physical cores. Your physical cores go inside your office plan, which is your processors. And your processors live on your office floor, which would be your node, OK? So the reason I go through all of that is so that when you see this N2, something immediately pops into your mind. It should hopefully be an office floor <laughs> full of cubicles, right? If I start talking about logical CPUs, those little workers inside of each cubicle that corresponds to this dash C16 uh, parameter here, those little people inside of each cubicle should pop to your mind. You should be thinking, oh, the hardware threads for the physical cores um, on my processor, right? And if I start, if you see this word here, cores, you should know that, that corresponds to those cubicles, right? Those are the physical cores uh, in the processor. And again, you know, processor for node also goes there. So, so this is how the terms are matching up to our system and how we're thinking about these things. OK, now to understand kind of the, the that was sort of the architecture. Now, this is sort of how we break up our problem. So that's when we do that, we're talking about the number of MPI tasks, the number of open MP threads. So the analogy for this one, uh, no, I'm sorry to have so many analogies at once, uh, but let's try to keep them separate. One was for hardware. This is really for you choosing how to break up the work of your simulation code, right? And so the way I'm going to ask you to think about that is you can think of this truck as sort of carrying a whole bunch of, you know, these are pallets, right? A whole bunch of pallets that all together correspond to your, your simulation code, the work that your simulation code needs to do. And you can break up all these little pieces of work into MPI, not little pieces, all these pallets, all these big pieces of work into MPI tasks. So if you do it that way, your MPI tasks you can consider as your pallet of different boxes. Now, if you want to further break that up by using OpenMP, you can think of M each MPI task being further broken up into the individual pieces with the threads, right? So that's where OpenMP th uh, comes in and that's where th the threads come in. We've got whole simulation code broken up into a number of MPI tasks, and each MPI task gets broken up into individual pieces of work. So that's the way to think about what's going on there. So now when we come back to the JavaScript again, and we look at this part, right, this dash N32, that's how you're dividing your work up into those pallets of boxes. So now when you look at this number, you have that in your mind. When I look at this line here, export OMP number of threads, that says for each one of those set of boxes, I'm going to break it up into eight pieces, 
So each pallet has eight boxes on it now. So this is how I'm further dividing down the work um, for the job that I do. So now, you know MPI task, you know thread, you have some intuitive sense about each of these pieces. So now if we go all the way down these lines, you should have a good sense of all those things. And I pointed out for NUMA domain, right? I didn't say much. So I'm going to give you the, the shortened, rather than spend a lot of time in introducing NUMA domains, I'm just going to give you the advice to follow to make sure um, the way you arrange your work respects the NUMA domains so that it will run efficiently. And the reason I can do that is because we have a sort of a general set of guidelines we give you that for most cases is pretty successful at helping your code run efficiently. And so this is what those guidelines are, right? So if you're looking at your number of MPI tasks, if that's more than the physical cores, right? So if your pallets of boxes, sorry, is less than or equal to. So if your pallet of boxes, right? If your simulation code is broken up to is less than the number of physical cores that are available. So, uh, then you're going to want to use the CPU underscore bind equals cores option. If MPI task is more than the number of physical cores available, then you're going to want to use threads. If you're doing a hybrid MPI open MP code, then you're going to want at least eight MPI tasks to avoid. Um, it, penalties is such a harsh word, but it's just, it's not as optimal as if you, if you use at least eight, you'll get a, a much more optimal uh, experience <laughs> uh, if you're using MP, OpenMP threads. Um, and one thing to also check is that uh, dash C should be greater than or equal to the, valid, the value of the number of threads. So you know, if you have two threads, you want dash C to be two or more, right? And then to make sure that those threads kind of um, execute close together. So if they're working on the same thing, because threads tend to work on similar things, um, it's nice if they work closely and not like one person works on this end of the office and that person works on that end of the office. And every time you want something, you have to walk back and forth. That can be kind of annoying and slow things down. But if you use these settings, it'll make sure that when you've got those two pieces of work together, it's the same two people in the cubicle working together. And that'll make sure that they can communicate quickly. So if you follow these guidelines to set those parameters, um, you, you know, we've found that in most cases you will get a, a good experience. So with all those things said, uh, we now know this part of the job script, right? That came from those guidelines I gave you. And you know this part of the job script that also came from those guidelines I just gave you. So we've kind of sort of covered the things that relate to the Newman domain and things that are associated with um, how threads are processed. So now, um, well, I guess in the next, later on, we're gonna go into like how we do some job scripts, but this slide here sort of incorporates um, the details from each of the different architectures on the nodes that we have, right? So, you know, Haswell, you're familiar with, Hori KNL, you're also familiar with. Uh, our focus today is Perlmutter CPUs, right? We've got 128 physical cores. We've got two logical CPUs per physical core, right? So again, these are the uh, cubicles, right? This is how many people are in each cubicle. This is how many uh, physical, how many logical CPUs per node. So how many people are in each uh, office floor, right? So if our office, our building floor has two office plans, how many people work in those that office floor, right? And this is how many NUMA domains, um, just sort of which areas communicate more quickly together. And this is the formula that you can use for each one of these different architectures to calculate the value of C, right? And so we'll use that in the next couple of slides. So that's where we get to job scripts. So um, what I'm gonna do here in these examples is I'm gonna look at a job script from Corey Haswell, and I'm gonna talk about how to change it to a job script for uh, the Perlmutter CPU node. So in particular, um, in this example, I've decided um, that I don't want to use OpenMP threading. And so I've set this variable at one, which is just kind of a best practice. And I've decided that I want to split up all the work in my simulation to, into 1,280 MPI tasks. Now, I mean, that's for me, um, how this number is chosen is kind of depends a lot really on your application. 
Um, tuning these parameters to find the optimal result it can be kind of application dependent. So I'm going to sort of be giving advice today as sort of general guidelines. Um, So yeah, so we've taken our work. We said we're going to split it up into 1,280 pallets. And for each pallet, I want to have, um, sorry, for each MPI task, I want two of my uh, workers to work on it, right? So two of those workers inside of a cubicle working on it. And so that's where that one comes from. So what I'm doing in this example is I'm keeping that constant, right? That dash C, I also want two workers to work on each MPI task over here. And so the thinking that I've gone through to, to come up with these numbers is like this, right? I've taken my total number of MPI processes and I've divided it by the number of nodes, right? So I had 32 MPI, sorry, MPI tasks, 32 MPI tasks on each node, right? Then I used that formula that you saw on the previous slide to determine the value of C to be two, right? So the same thinking kind of happens over here for the Perlmutter CPU, right? So now I've done, I have 1,280 MPI tasks. I divide that by the 10 nodes here, right? And well, I should say that this is, this is how I came to the number 10 here, is I thought, okay, if I take 1,280 and divide that by 10, I get 128. And I know that if I put in 128 into that formula from the last page, I'll get two. All right, so I know that that's the right number to put in this formula, which means that this number should be 10, which means that the number of nodes that I want should be 10. And so this will run the same amount of work with two logical CPUs on each MBI task, just as before, but I only have to use 10 nodes instead of 40 nodes, right? So that's a, an example of moving one to the other. Um, in this example, now I'm keeping the number of nodes constant and I'm changing the number of logical CPUs for each MPI task. So it's a similar thing, right? Same, co same uh, computation here. Over here, I'm splitting up uh, my MPI task across the 40 nodes. So each node gets 32 processes. Um, but because there are more um, physical cores and logical cores available on a ProMutter CPU node, um, I can afford to associate eight logical CPUs to each MPI task uh, instead of just two. So um, this might, you know, this is sort of throwing more workers at the same amount of problems. So this is sort of an example where we get to play this game. Um, you've got 32 nodes, uh, sorry, we've got our, our work. We've decided to split it up into 512 MPI tasks. We're gonna split it across 32 nodes. What do we want the value of C to be if in this configuration? Well, um, here is my hint, right? I'm splitting my 512 MPI tasks across 32 nodes. So that gives me 16. I put that in that formula as before, right? And I, because I'm doing OpenMP, I have to do that check for my rules, right? I find that check and that tells me it's good. This also sort of gives away the answer, right? Because I'm making that check here and tells me that the answer to this question is uh, 16. And I'm basing this on the assumption that I want to make full use of all the computational power on the on the node. Um, if you want to, you know, I, the job script generator is a sort of an automatic, uh, does this thinking for you so that automatically you can put in your parameters and your, your uh, requirements and what you think you want, and it will generate these job scripts for you. Um, so it's a good way to learn, um, and it's also a good way to get a job script uh, out and, and, and get you some, something to try that seems reasonable. Um, you can find this in two locations now, um, both these work, so I'm giving you both here. And with that, I'm going to sort of summarize. Uh, so the key suggestions for my talk are use module spider rather than module avail. It will show you more things. Um, recompile your query codes on Perlmutter. You've got the GNU programming environment, you have the Cray programming environment, the NVIDIA program at, they're worth trying. Um, you know, obviously start with the default, then move to the others. Uh, use the compiler wrappers because they do so much. Um, you know, kind of, it's kind of unseen, but there's a lot of uh, optimizations and, and other things being pulled in. Um, and it allows you to more easily try the different programming environments. And, uh, you know, look back at, obviously, uh, look back at your job scripts and, and try to, uh, you know, recalculate your JavaScript parameters for, for optimal performance on Perlmutter. 
And with that, uh, there's only one more note here. Um, do you, Helen, is this the, usually the slide that you talk on? <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, so during the hands-on session later, um, we have prepared for the um, uh, CPU, um, this part of the exercises. Uh, this is the GitHub repo there. And um, we have a readme dot first, but basically tells you, you uh, encourage you to work in this order. And then you have a readme file for each example, hello world serial and MPI code. And then um, matrix multiplication of or Jacobi, which is a C example or for chain example to do hybrid MPI and open MP. And we also have an XT high affinity example. You can compare Cori, compare uh, uh, on the CPU side, on parameter CPU, find out all these flags that <laughs> Eric talked about and uh, understand more with the, 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 the what, what uh, core is with um, high, uh, high, hyper threads or that your OpenMP and MPI OpenMP threads are binding on. There's also a GSL test. Uh, there's a software installed from E4S stack and how to use package from there. And uh, the readme also has the, the instructions how to do the job scripts or as alloc using the re reserved nodes and to, to, to use during the reservation hours, make sure to use the um, project and train eight. Yeah. Uh, and with that, I will say thank you for listening. And um, you, know, uh, you can put questions in the Ducal doc or you know, later if you ever need help, uh, you know, submit a ticket. I'd be happy to help you. Thank okay, you, thank Eric, you. for a very engaging, interesting talk. Lots of cool tips on analogies and, and cartoons. 